Hey team, welcome to the Charge Forward Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Cripps, coming to you from the Hit Lab studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks so much for joining us again. I have a special guest today, Mr. Jamie Steelman. Jamie, how you doing today? Great, great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, absolutely. So, I mean, you're a rock star in the mortgage space, family man, six kids? Six kids, yes, sir. That's a big family. It is. It is. Big, blended family and uh, love every bit of it. I love it. That's fantastic, man. Well, thank you for coming out with us today. How long have you been in mortgages? So it's coming up on about, I looked at the date the other day. I try not to look specifically, but it's about 28, coming up on 29 years. So getting close oh, wow. to that 30 number. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. Now you've seen some ups and some downs and some sideways. <laughs> been through things. been through a lot of different market changes. Um, I was just, you know, talking earlier. It's like, you know, everybody's like, hey, are rates going down? I'm like, yeah, it looks like we're, we're in a motion where we're going to see a little bit better rates. But Either way it goes, you know, it's, I've been through all that kind of stuff up and down. People always buy homes. So I love what I do. Um, you know, regardless of what the rate is, I get to talk to people about, you know, buying their home, moving up into a bigger home, becoming a first time home buyer, all that kind of stuff. So I, I really love what I do and would never want to do anything else. I love it. You know, um, I would imagine at this stage of the game, you've probably helped some people really kind of go from their first starter home all the way to like whether it be the pinnacle home or hey now we're selling and we're going to travel oh absolutely absolutely it's one of the cool things about you know getting on the little bit of an older side is i not only get to see people that were first time home buyers that eventually move into that that big home mm -hmm. or they want to travel or they start to buy investment properties and okay. they've you know start to build a portfolio and kind of go through that and it's kind of fun to sit down with them and go man at one point we were just talking about you not renting an apartment and now you've got a portfolio of, you know, six investment properties that you're Airbnb in here or you're making money from that. And so it's it's really cool to see people, you know, take that step. And then other people that are just happy owning their home and they're traveling and doing different things. And then um, all the way full circle um, to the age thing again, mm -hmm. um, but to where I'm doing mortgages for kids that I coached when they were little in baseball or kids that, you know, went to school with my kids. And that's that's just it, it's a it's a huge thing. And it's so rewarding. And it's really cool to go, man. I remember that kid running around my living room, you know, yeah. tackling, playing around. And then now they're married, buying a home, having kids, that kind of stuff. So those kind of full circle moments are really fun. Well, and I think it kind of goes hand in hand because, you know, there's got to be a level of trust on the, on the baseball field or, you know, on the football field, whatever it is you're coaching. You know, those parents have trusted you with not only their child's time, but their attention and, and what they're going to learn, good, bad, or ugly from you. And, you know, fast forward now, 10, 20, 30, 40, yeah. 30, 30 years later, here you are and you're guiding them through what is the beginning of the largest purchases of their life. Sure. And that's, that's one of the coolest things. I mean, I tell people all the time, mostly, mostly my family, you know, it's, it's so cool to have a 25 year old person call you and go, Hey coach, mm -hmm. I'm looking at buying a house. I need you to do this kind of stuff. So it's just, it. You know, my wife is a former dance teacher, so she taught ballet and tap and that kind of stuff. So she'll have girls reach out to her, you know, that she taught forever ago, checking in and just, you know, hey, Miss Stacy and that kind of stuff. And so it's it's really great all that time you got to pour into people that they still have that trust level and they want to get your opinion on what they're doing, you know, now in their life. So it's, it's really special. Well, and I don't know if it has the same effect on you or not, but when somebody calls me coach, I mean, it just, it feels... Every void in your body, you're just like 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Yeah. And, and what can I do to help you? You know, it's just, it puts that wind underneath you like nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. And I've talked to my wife about it. I'm just saying it a second ago. I just got like warm my whole body. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. I told, I told her, I was like, man, I hope some of those kids forever just call me that. It means so much to hear it. They probably don't realize it, but it's just, you know, it's in their head and it's a, it's a respect thing. You feel like you've definitely had an impact in their life if they're willing to refer to you that way, oh, yeah. you know, so it's, you're absolutely right. It, it gives me chills. It, it just, yeah. Fills you up with joy big time when you hear somebody say that. Yeah. And that's why she loves it when a dancer will say, you know, Hey, Miss Stacy, I'm doing this. Or she'll post on fo Facebook, congratulations on, you know, your kid or whatever. And they'll you know type back. Thanks so much, Miss Stacy. And so we talk about it all the time. Yeah. It's just fills you with joy. Oh yeah. And you love hearing where they are, what they're doing. Yeah. And, and really, to me, like what really tells you whether or not you made an impact is how excited they get to tell you yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's just. Yeah. And I just, you know, we recently had our, our blood drive 
Um, and I had some, some ball players that I've had before. And when they walk in and not only just say like, Hey coach, or they just give you this huge hug. Mm -hmm. It's like one of your kids hugging you. I mean, it's just, it's, you can't explain how, how, how great it just fills you up and, and you know what it does for you. It's just, it's amazing. Okay. So you just, you just mentioned this blood drive. I've been hearing about it. So this is the eighth annual. Yes, sir. And, and how, how was our success on this one? It was unbelievable. We're still kind of waiting on official, official numbers, Mm -hmm. but Looks like we, you know, surpassed the other seven years, which is amazing. Yeah. We had a couple of years that we went through COVID where it was harder to get people in, and we had some really good numbers through that time. But um, this year was just just amazing. I mean, yeah. it looks like we're going to be at about 140 units collected, yeah. and we do that in about five or six hours. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, that has the potential to save 420 lives. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just huge, huge impact. And, um we started it about eight years ago and come in full circle. Just so many stories, kind of like we were talking about people coming in. And uh, it's just, it's been phenomenal. Some of the, the purpose and some of the impact that's came out of why we started it and what we're doing it for. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to, selfishly, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out there. There's so many reasons for somebody to donate blood. Uh, so many selfish reasons. You get a health benefit by your body not having that blood and, and generating new blood, uh, especially if you're a male. You Most people, not if you're anemic, but most, most males especially, you're going to get a benefit from it dropping your ferritin levels. Obviously, check with your doctor, you know, and those types of things. They A lot of times they check it right there. But uh, there's a lot of selfish benefits, but there's a lot of selfless benefits as well in that you potentially save multiple lives with just one donation. Uh, my sister in particular has been saved twice, uh, once 20 years ago this month and once just about four months ago. So please get out there. They have a, a Red Cross app. You can donate or find a wonderful blood drive like the one that Jamie sponsors every year. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I didn't know that your sister had, had an experience like that. I mean, yeah, ours, ours is very personal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our I lost my oldest son, Ryan in 2016 and um, he passed away in a motorcycle crash and everybody kind of always thinks oh I'm sure you do the the blood drive to bring awareness to that kind of stuff and completely different so Mm -hmm. it's great when we get to share his story Um, he was uh, born at Vanderbilt Hospital Mm -hmm. and when he was born his uh, mother's placenta separated lost tons of blood Mm -hmm. so he was delivered emergency c-section and had to have two blood transfusions just to survive oh my gosh and uh, so he had a b negative blood Mm -hmm. which is the the rarest and uh, they said, you know, this is 1994. So they told us, you know, if you wouldn't have been at Vanderbilt, you know, maybe in a rural hospital, may not have even had it on hand. And would they have been able to get it from wherever to where you were at? So literally, you know, blood donation gave us 21 years with him mm-hmm. that we would have not had without. So we're forever grateful that we had that time with him. And we want to give other people that gift of life through remembering him. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Um it's, it's just a God thing. You yeah. were in the right place, you know, and, and got to spend 21 wonderful years with him. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm. so grateful for that. Um, our family has done that blood drive for the last eight years now. And we've just, we've crossed paths with so many different lives. You know, like I kind of was telling you just having the people come out and donate because they're just doing it to be there and to donate yeah. blood is one thing, but the, the stories over and over that come out now that we're eight years into it of mm-hmm. people that have, not just knew us from baseball, knew us from the community, but the impact of what we're doing, the hashtag that we use and people coming in and telling us little stories. You know, I had a lady walk over to me um, while we were doing stuff and said, Hey, are you Ryan's dad? And I said, yeah. And she said, I I just wanted to tell you last year, I got married in this building after your blood drive. Y'all were cleaning up while we were setting up my wedding. And um, she said, I just, I read about it a little bit because I saw all the signs and everything. Love y'all's cause. Me and my dad used to donate blood together because he's got some stuff in his family. And I had got to where I had a few donations that were a little rough, got bruising and stuff, and I kind of got discouraged. And my dad had sat down a couple weeks before the wedding. We were just talking about life and different things. And he said, you know, you really need to find a cause that will get you back Mm -hmm. into donating because it meant so much to you. And she was, you know, she kind of just grabbed me by the arm and she said, this is my cause. And uh, it was just you know, and I had a couple of people around me at the time that mm-hmm. had been helping and volunteering for the last couple of years. And it was just that impact of somebody that said, Hey, I'm using something you're doing to mm-hmm. really make a difference in my life was just kind of like, wow. Yeah. That's why we started this. Well, really and truly, I mean, it, 
when you when you give, you you get a different feeling that you don't get really from anything else. Sure. Or, I mean, coaching is a version of giving, but donating blood is a version of giving. And, and I think sometimes the reason people need to make that connection to a cause is because they don't see the person it benefits. It's a great point. And so there's that disconnection of, oh, I just gave something and, you know, it's just out into the ether. Yeah. No, that, that, that blood gets somewhere. Somebody puts it to good use. And in some places, I mean, there's a drastic shortage. Sure, sure. So, and you referenced the uh, mobile app the mm -hmm. Red Cross has. Yeah. There's actually a place on there that's called the Blood Journey. Mm -hmm. So now you can actually donate. You look back on the app and it tells you, hey, my blood's being tested. My blood's been approved. It's it's at Baptist Hospital here, St. Thomas, whatever it's called now. So you can actually follow that and get a little bit of that sense of, hey, yeah. I got to watch, you know, not only did I give that day to help, but here's, it's at, it's at somewhere being used. It is, so. it is. And it, it does help because you, you, it's not... Uh, it kind of connects you to where your yours went, yeah. And and that may not seem valuable, but as somebody who donates regularly, it is. Yeah, I mean, I look it up every time. Yeah. And uh, you know, another another great part about the app is it uh, it lets you schedule close to your house. Yeah. And so you know, I schedule. I mean, the last time I donated, it was four doors down from my house. That's pretty cool. I mean. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah. the ability to do that is, is just invaluable. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, again, please get out there, please donate, uh, research causes, find one that, that speaks, uh, to your heart and, and, and be sure to donate regularly. Thank you. Um, all right. So the kind of the essence of the charge forward, forward podcast is people who, uh, charge forward during those moments that would break some people. And I, I can't think of a, a a more spot on instance. Um, and I'm not asking you to relive those moments, but, uh, you know, how, how did you push forward through that? Sure. Um, it, it's, it's been a journey mm -hmm. and I think it's a, it's an ongoing journey. Mm -hmm. It's something that, um, you know, you never really, never really move on from, um, but you move on in a different way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people use terms like, you know, a new normal, or wherever there might be just to kind of get your head around it. But, you know, we, we were very lucky that we have a, a very caring community. Mm -hmm. We had some friends step forward that of course we thought were friends at the time, but we became, you know, we really found out what they mean to us through family. that time. Yeah. Big time family. And, uh, we had some real young people, you know, mm -hmm. so when Ryan passed away, we had that summer of 2016, we not only lost him, but we had two kids graduate high school at the same time. Both were leaving the house to go to college so we lost him and then we basically felt like our house was going from you know five kids at home to one yeah. <laughs> at home just you know almost overnight um so it was a big change and we had um some real some friends of theirs that hang around and uh particularly a friend of my daughter's that basically came to the house stayed at the house every once in a while mm -hmm. and said hey i'm not leaving not leaving until i feel like gabby and the rest of y'all are okay yeah. And, uh, she still has a real special place in our life and, uh, not sure what gave her that, you know, that intestinal fortitude at such a young age to be like, Hey, I'm going to look these, these adults <laughs> that are, you know, same age as my parents and say, I'm here for you. And I'm not going anywhere until you mm -hmm. tell me I can't stay here anymore. So there yeah. were some real special people that stepped up, but, um, you know, biggest th part I think about moving through anything like that, I had to learn, um, cause I didn't move forward at all at first. Mm -hmm. I kind of shut down and went through a lot of the the denial mm -hmm. and a lot of the, the questioning and questioning everything in this world and beyond. Yeah. Um, at that time. And as time, you know, moved fast, moved faster. Um, I finally was able to talk to a few people. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the biggest key that helped me at least take a few steps forward was shutting down and keeping everything inside. Um, I'm definitely one of those, those guys that, you know, kind of suppresses everything and tries to say, I'm okay. I'm fine. I'll move forward. Um, but I really learned through that experience how speaking with other people, talking mm -hmm. to other people, not only opened my heart up to figure out, you know, that there's things we don't control, mm -hmm. um, but also that there's other people that are going through things. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like definitely in my heart of hearts, I feel like I went through something incredibly tragic that I uh, will never get over and daily life will not be the same. But I've learned that there's a lot of people dealing with a lot of things out mm -hmm. there. And the best thing we can do is be there for others. Yeah. And give them, give them that voice or give them that ear, whatever, to help them through some of that stuff. And that was 
probably the biggest major breakthrough I had was just finally learning how to talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I had, I heard somebody say one time that it was, uh, you live every day because they didn't get the opportunity to. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, I think you have to, I yeah. think you, otherwise you, you don't get through it. Yeah. And I feel like we're, we're really lucky as a family, you know, getting to share Ryan's story. He was a huge at his age. He just loved adventure, loved living life. And, uh, one of the things I'm getting more of an understanding of it now, but it used to puzzle me mm -hmm. as a, as a 15, 16 year old kid, Ryan would always say like, Hey, go do it today. Tomorrow's not promised. Mm -hmm. He would just constantly say things like that. And we're like, you know, I've talked a lot about everybody having a five year plan, 10 year plan. Like he had a five minute plan. Yeah. He was always about like, what could we do now to, you know, just enjoy this moment. Yeah. Um, so many stories like that. And so many of his friends have came back and said exactly what you just said. Talked to a few of them at the blood drive and they were like, Hey man, I hope he knows that we're, we're living because he didn't get to, mm -hmm. we're traveling because he didn't get to. Yeah. And I love the stories that I see some of his great friends. I mean, he has a good friend that just went to Italy last week and just, I mean, there's, there's this group of good friends that he had that are just out there doing things. And they always make a note to shoot me a quick text or let me know, you know, Hey, we're doing this or, this was, this was really interesting. Isn't this, isn't this crazy that I'm here? What yeah. would Ryan think about this? Yeah. And it just reminds me and drives me forward to go, that's what he would want. Yeah. That's what he'd be doing right now. So the fact that he left that impact that drove others to do that kind of stuff wakes me up to the fact of, Hey, don't, don't sit here, mm -hmm. share his story, share what he would be doing and do some of the stuff that he would be doing. Cause that's what he'd be telling me to do. I mean, if I was standing in my house right now and he came in the door, I know he would be like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. What are we doing today? You know, it just wasn't about being bored at yeah. all. So, uh, so that, that helps me a lot to have them. This event every year gives me a chance to see them face to face. I mean, we had a couple <clears throat> kind of his best friend growing up, you know, made the trip from North Carolina here just to donate blood, to be there around everybody on that day. Yeah. So that's yeah. special. That's, yeah. that's a moment right there. Yeah. It's really cool. That's wonderful. Um, you know, I, th I think just in general, uh, as we get older, um, the the norm or whatever we want to call it uh, takes us from that childlike default to yes to a default to no and I think it is just an ongoing battle that we as parents we as just people trying to to be positive and, and be awesome every day we have to try to remind ourselves that whenever possible we should default to yes I love that I love that yeah yeah makes more sense to say yes and enjoy it while we're here. Yeah. You know, than to, than to shrink up back up and just say no. Yeah. That's right. Love that. Now, uh, so how many of y'all do you have it at home still? Just one, just one, okay. just one at home. Um, Willa, our youngest, uh, she finished cosmetology school last year Okay. and she's got a small shop in green Hills that she, uh, took over from my late father-in-law okay. who cut hair for 45, 50 years. Wow. And so she kind of, uh, had a huge advantage in life that most people don't have got to step right out of cosmetology school and have a place to, to run a business. So she's learning how to cut hair and run a whole business at the same time, but it's a huge opportunity for her. So, uh, she's still at home getting the business off the ground until she can be on her own. But yeah, just, just one at home and then, um, have a, uh, granddaughter that's, that's here local that's seven and a granddaughter that was just born in South Carolina. So okay, we're, we're moving into the next phase uh, of children, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Being grandparents. Absolutely. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. That's good stuff. Uh, and so, and this is this is one I haven't asked anybody, but um, so how would you describe Stacy? How would you describe your lovely wife? Man, there's there's not enough words. <laughs> you know, with what we were just talking about, mm -hmm. I, I have no idea how in the world I would have ever you know put one step forward without her. Um, she is truly the rock, truly the person that keeps our our family together. Mm -hmm. You know, we refer to our big blended family um, because she had three. I had three. Came together with six kids and. At one point, we had five teenagers at the same time, and she was the one responsible for getting everybody to school. And, you know, I'm showing up to coach a game, but she's getting everybody to the game mm -hmm. and making sure they've all got their stuff. And they're, I'm leaving work, showing up on the field, and like, hey, where's everybody at? So, yeah. um, and just, just everything, mm -hmm. cheer practices, volleyball, you know, every, every, all of our kids were involved in a lot of activities. We encouraged that a lot when they were kids because I feel like there's a – strong connection to being coached, mm -hmm. being a part of a team, learning a lot of life lessons 
regardless of what sport or activity it is, we encourage them a lot to be a part of something. And uh, it's paid huge dividends as adults. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, she's she's the one that got everybody everywhere and still does mm-hmm. and uh, holds everything together for us. And I don't I don't take it lightly at all. She's uh, we actually I could probably talk to you for an hour about how our relationship came to be. But we've known each other since we were seven years old. Oh, wow. Um, her her parents had a hair salon. OK. And my mom managed a daycare right next door. So we kind of saw each other after school, family, friends, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, never dated. Mm-hmm. Both went off and did our own things and somehow found each other back together. So, you know, oh, wow. it's, a, it's a pretty cool relationship because we get to uh, not only share the future and our kids and everything now, but we get to go back and kind of talk about we grew up in the same place. We're around mm-hmm. a lot of the same stuff. So there's a lot of stories when we weren't a couple Mm -hmm. that we get to kind of share different perspectives from and know what each other are talking about. So it's, it's a really cool thing. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That is, that is really cool. That's good. Um, what is, what is, what is something unexpected, um, that, that has happened in either business or in, in, in life outside of that, that one major moment that, uh, that you you had to push through that you had to decide we're going to buckle down down as a as a couple or um you know it could be in business what's 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 one of those that you you had you just ran through it sure in business um and and business kind of flows into family of course when you're when you're self-employed and you're an entrepreneur so Hmm. um a couple years ago i'd been at a bank you know for about eight years and kind of been been a loan officer kind of doing the mortgage thing for a while and had a lot of success and loved it Um, but had an opportunity to kind of go out on my own with the backing of a larger company. So, you know, now I do mortgages. My, my team is team Stillman mortgage at CMG home loans. Mm -hmm. So they're the larger company, but it's just a much different setup. It's much more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. It's much more my own business. And we had a lot of discussions because I had gotten really comfortable Mm -hmm. doing what I was doing, but I felt like, felt like I could help more people. Mm-hmm. I could do more things for our business, for our family and take us to, you know, bigger places. And so I was, you know, probably 48 at the time, 51 now. So I was kind of, you know, Hey, are we, are we on track, you mm-hmm. know, to retire? Or am I enjoying what I'm doing? Am I doing everything that I want to do with this? Yeah. And this opportunity came up and it was, uh, you know, the timing felt right, but it was a, it was a hard decision. Mm-hmm. Um, Because, you know, you get eight to 10 years with one group, you get a group of people, you know, didn't necessarily want to leave the people that I worked with, but the opportunity seemed to to make sense and felt like, hey, I can, I can really make a difference Mm -hmm. if I go do this. But it was a, it was a hard step to take. Sure. And we talked about it and it's, it's been the greatest decision I've ever made. Um, But at the time there was a lot of, oh man, what if, what if I step out here and I can't step back kind of taking your, you know, stepping off the dock with both feet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, like if we're going to do this. We're going to jump in, you know, and, uh, it's, it's been really great. Well, if you're going to do it, you got to commit. Yeah. Just plain and simple. Yeah. And how many team, team members do you have with you now? Um, I have three, um, on my direct team. And then okay. of course we've got processors, underwriters that are dedicated to our staff. Sure. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's been phenomenal when I was where I was, I didn't have a team. I was just kind of part of this company mm-hmm. and happened to be, you know, happened to be a loan officer. So now kind of building that thing and mentoring other people. So mm-hmm. a lot of people on my team have aspirations to do other things. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of learning the business through me, which kind of gives me that coach feeling again. Absolutely. Um, you know, I didn't realize at the time how much I missed that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be sitting and telling Stacy like, man, it was so cool. You know, so-and-so asked me this question. I got to kind of tell him, well, this is how it works. You know, here's how you get from A to B and, you know, I'm coaching again, mm-hmm. not realizing that that's what I'm really technically doing by, you know, title right. or whatever. So it's, it's been really cool to build that team and to watch it grow. I mean, we're just two years in Mm -hmm. and uh, we've been able to help a whole lot of people work with a whole lot of different agents and teams. And um, it's just, it's, it's been a really great move for me and I'm really glad that I did it. I love it. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that I like to ask everybody is especially, I mean, you've got six kids. So most families, especially middle-class money, wasn't talked around, talked about around the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. money wasn't taught inside the house. And I think that is one of those pieces that is just missing just across the board is that financial responsibility, understanding how money works, understanding how, you know, um, when you provide value, now money change hand, changes hands. Um, how, how big of a conversation was that around the kitchen table or, or with your kids? Huge. Um, you probably can't, you know, state it enough because I, I grew up, 
with no discussions of money at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, my parents never talked about it at all. You know, I learned kind of how we grew up and how we made it with some family members that helped us along the way much after the fact, Mm -hmm. everything was just kind of not talked about and how anything worked. So I got out of school with no clue and I kind of learned the hard way ups and downs and different things. But yeah, once me and me and Stacy got together, it was a big topic of conversation still is. I mean, we, and I, and I tell a lot of my clients this kind of stuff too, you know, we've encouraged with all the technology that's out there now, all of my kids know how to go on to credit karma, see what's on their credit, see what's reporting, what's not reporting, how important it is to have, you know, some things in order. Mm -hmm. We talked about debt, you know, good debt, bad debt, what's okay, what to do, you know, homeownership, of course, is a big topic in our house, but just, just the day to day stuff, Mm -hmm. I'm talking to them. And I think we all want to give our kids things that we didn't have. And that falls into that. I mean, advice, financial advice is huge because it was not talked about in school for me at all. It wasn't talked about at home. Mm -hmm. Um, It just, you know, learned everything I learned the hard way and uh, really want them to, you know, there's that fine line between helping your, your kids and teaching your kids things. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, because you want to teach them things. Yeah. You want them to learn how to, you know, prepare for when you're not here Mm -hmm. and, you know, what they want to do, how they want to manage things. And if things aren't going right, you know, how to research it, figure out what you're doing. So, yeah, big topic in our house was kind of, you know, like saving. And uh, it's really cool now that some of the kids are in their late 20s. Mm -hmm. um, We kind of joke, you know, a couple of our kids have these savings accounts that have a little bit of money in them, you Mm -hmm. know, whether they're, they're married or not. But they've got these accounts that we started when they were kids. And they'll dump a little money in there and they're like, you know, we'll ask them about something like, oh, I don't, I don't spend that money. That's not real money. Mm -hmm. That's mine. (laughs) It was kind of like when my, one of my sons started his first job when he was in high school, you know, we'd be like, Hey, you're working. Why are you asking me for gas money? He's like, well, I want to spend my money on Mm -hmm. that. (laughs) So we had to, we had to kind of go through that, you know, but, but it's great that they have that saving mindset. They all want to not only have their checking account with what comes from what they work, but they've thought about savings and stuff. I mean, I, I had a really rough time as a, a young adult in my 20s, and I didn't even, I never had a savings account until yeah. much later in life because I was just trying to, every check, make it to the next one. So a checking account was all I needed. There wasn't any money to save. Yeah. Um, so just teaching them the, those aspects and, and those, you know, practices has been has been very beneficial to look back to. Like we were talking about feeling good. It's kind of some of those things you see your kids do or hear that they're doing. You're like, oh, man, that's stuck. How about that? <laughs> like. One of the most fun things that, uh, that I, it's kind of a game I play with my 10 year old. Um, cause he's got a little, he's got a couple yards that he mows. And so I introduced him to the Dave Ramsey investment calculator. Yeah. And so having him play with the numbers, well, what if I put $50 a month in there and I'm 10 years old now, what does oh, that wow. look like? And uh, I would say he's sharper than most college kids when it comes to money. I bet. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but if you turn it into a game, and, and so that there's, there's this back and forth and they can explain things to you. And then, uh, I, th- I think that one of the most powerful things that you can do is teach your children how money works. Yeah. I think there's, yeah, that's really high on the list. Yeah. yeah. Cause they need to know yeah. it's, um, you know, people talk about the good and the bad of money and all that kind of stuff, having a savings account and being able to save money doesn't just give you opportunities. It also, when things go wrong, you have options. Yeah. You, you know? don't, you don't have that desperate moment. Yeah. You yeah. don't, uh, it changes the way you make decisions too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can stop and say, I've got this $500 car repair mm-hmm. and you can go, I don't want to use this money out of my savings, but I'm glad I've got it to take care of that. As opposed to, like you said, what am I going to do? Yeah. My car's broke down. I can't get to work cause I have no money in the bank. So just preparing ahead of time is, is good for all people, but teaching that to your kids gives you a peace of mind that, you know, they're, they're thinking forward and they're going to be okay when something comes up. Yeah. They're going to think, okay, this is why I did this. Well, and so many people have so much drama in their world anyway, whether we're talking about if that destroys a marriage or destroys a relationship with you and your child, or even if it just yeah. makes for a bad week, um, you having savings, you having money available probably has never made that a worse situation. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. You know, that's a really good point. Yeah. It probably hasn't made it worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, have you had a mentor along the way? A lot. Yeah. A lot. Who's yeah. the most powerful? Who's the one that just pops in your head and you're like, Oh, oh my man. gosh. I, I've, I've probably told so many people about this, but I've told her more times than I can count. And it's been a few years since I've got to speak to her, but everybody kind of has that, that favorite teacher. They mm-hmm. remember some that were just impactful because they made things easier 
Um, mine, because they had a, I, I, I think it's a life saving, um, role in my life. Okay. Um, so I, you know, like I said, early, early teens, early, uh, you know, adulthood, I was kind of all over the place. Didn't know what I wanted to do a whole lot. And, uh, basically, um, walked away from high school, um, in my sophomore, sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just thought I'm not going to go the rest of the year. I'll go back next year. And I was kind of le left my home really early, moved out really, really at a young age and thought I knew what I was doing and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, I had an English teacher, um, that kind of ran into me one day and she said, yeah, you're, you're coming back to school and we're going to finish. We're going to make sure you finish. And, uh, she had just always been kind of larger than life to me, really listened to her a lot. She was a, she was a track coach, mm -hmm. women, a girls track coach. So I didn't, you know, wasn't my coach, but she just took an interest. And, uh, the year that I came back that year and I spent every lunch period, my junior year grading papers and doing stuff for her because she wanted to make sure that I was on track and doing what I was supposed to do. And I mean, completely turned around my whole thinking on what, what I wanted to do at such a young age that I feel like it was life-saving because I probably I didn't have anybody in my life at the time that was really pushing mm -hmm. at the time. And it's not, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those blame came kind of persons, but you know, both my parents were really young when they got married, mm -hmm. didn't finish school. So it wasn't a big deal that their kids weren't finished in school. It's just kind yeah. of, kind of breaking that cycle mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I needed somebody to step in that would make a difference. And, uh, and she did. And I mean, went on to do, you know, finish school, of course, went on to do more stuff, doing what I'm doing now. And I think there's these little time periods in your life that, you know, you never know where God's going to take you mm -hmm. and you don't have to have this to succeed at that. You can always start at any time, but I just feel like it was really pivotal. And it really, I think it's part of the biggest reason I started coaching and I enjoy mentoring so much is because somebody stepped in when I needed them to and said, you know, this is what you need to do. And was just such a positive influence. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't this, uh, person that was just riding me all the time. It was just somebody saying, this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Let me show you how this, and, and it got me, you know, grading papers and stuff helped me develop an, an interest in reading and English and doing more at that time. Yeah. And so it just, it drove everything. It made me, made my grades better, made me want to show up at school, made me want to finish. So it was, uh, it was really cool. So Miss Sanders, um, and she just, she changed my life big time. Ooh, I love it. Miss yeah. Sanders, thank you so much. I mean, just this guy. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I, I've got one of those too. Um, yeah. Miss Kate McGlasson, you'll be on the podcast soon. Um, <laughs> same yeah. thing. You know, I was in, in high school and um, uh, I, had a, I had a very destructive teacher in, in elementary school and I didn't have confidence. Yeah. And had a couple teachers along the way that helped pick me up, but she's the one that showed me that I wanted to teach, showed yeah. me that I wanted to uh, be the one coaching. Man, that's awesome. So we're, we, we share that for sure. Yeah. Um, how do you like to engage with people? And uh, whether that's in business, getting new customers, that, that type of thing, what's, what's kind of your special sauce that's made you successful? Yeah. I mean, we're just talking about it. I mean, I love, I'm kind of old school and I love face to face. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of one of the rare breeds in the mortgage business that still likes to go out and meet with people or have them come to the office when they can. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer and I understand the world that we're real technology driven. Some people are just like, Hey, tell me where to go online, apply for a mortgage and I'll do it. I don't need to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I'll send you my docs. Let me know when we're closing. And that's, that's perfectly cool if somebody wants to do it. But I really love sitting down with people. Um, I meet with agents that I work with. I meet with clients that want to, um, I take phone calls kind of, you know, round the clock. If I've got somebody that works third shift and they get off at 5 AM, I'll set an alarm, jump up, talk to them where people are going to say, you know, I've got business hours and I, I time block and I tell people I'll call them back the next business day and all these kind of, you know, things that can be good for some mm -hmm. people's, but I've just always tried to cater to what people need if I can. And if there's a way I can, you know, learn a little bit more about them, you know, if it is that person that works a different shift, it's great to find out why they work that shift. Is that so that they can see their kids more? Is it because it's the only shift that's available? Um, it just, it leads to so much more. And I love to know why people do what they do, why they're in the situations they are, where they're going, why they want to buy a home. Mm -hmm. So I really love to get to know people. 
Uh, there you are again, defaulting to yes. <laughs> You're right. You're right. I, I love it. I love it. That 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 child that's still in you is going. Hey, uh, uh-uh, uh, yeah. no, we can we can go meet this guy. Yeah, there's got to be a way. That's right. That's right. Making it happen. Um, what's next for you? Well, um, you know, started the team two years ago. Yeah. So really hoping to to grow that some. So I love what I do. Um, I don't think I ever want to have a different role. Um, besides doing mortgages for people, I've had a lot of offers to get into management and do that kind of stuff. And it's not really something that, although management's kind of coaching, um, I really like, you know, really enjoy talking with people. I go to my closings every chance that I get. So I like to be there. I'd like to be there for the fun stuff. Yeah. And I don't really want to be the guy in the suit sitting in the corporate office somewhere managing spreadsheets. It's just, not something I've ever wanted to do. And when it gets offered to me, I'm like, thank you, you know, huge um, compliment. But but I like doing this. So, you know, hopefully we'll get to grow the team a little bit, bring on some other loan officers to be a part of what we're doing mm-hmm. and just help more people and just be, you know, be a trusted source for people. That's what I really want to do. I don't really want to change what I'm doing, but I want to do more of what I'm doing. Yeah. And then, you know, um, got kids growing up and grandkids coming. So hopefully somewhere in there, there'll be a little bit of me and Stacy time, mm-hmm. maybe traveling a little bit. And, uh, and then we're really working on growing the impact of the blood drive. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's once a year right now. And I don't know if we'll ever, you know, expand it into more, but we definitely want to bring attention to the cause and to the need for blood year round. Yeah. So we're really kind of stepping forward and trying to say, you know, how else can we do that? How can we you know, encourage people to do the app, go on there and join the team a little bit more. So when you've got a time, a chance to go give and you don't have to wait till next August. Mm -hmm. So really kind of expand that reach and, uh, and, you know, be more impactful. Um, I think what you were talking about with really people learning how giving blood can be healthy Mm -hmm. and it can do things for them. So I think, you know, there's just, we started out with just this one time a year, mm-hmm. do this big event, and we really want to make it where we can, you know, have an impact more often. Yeah. And also people that have gone through the reason we started the blood drive, you know, missing my kid. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be really cool just to to be out there and let people know that, hey, we're here to talk about it. We've been through it, maybe something similar. Um, I've really found just talking about it a little bit more publicly, which I've never mm-hmm. really done before except around the blood drive. Mm-hmm. I've been amazed some of the people that have messaged me on Instagram or different places that are, hey, like, just thanks for sharing your story. I know yeah. it's tough, but thanks for talking about it. So I'm, I've am i learned over the last couple of, you know, four or five months that there are people that want to hear what we have to say. Mm-hmm. And that was a little bit tough for me because I was like, you know, I don't want to I don't want to sound sad and I don't want to I don't want to get real emotional. While I'm going through all this stuff and trying to, you know, basically relive it because in my head, I'm like, I do that every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but learning when we were talking about with age, you know, learning what I want to do. So I I want to stay in my lane mortgage wise. So I know that's what I want to do. And, and with the blood drive and give life for Ryan, I think there's, I think there's some people that we can help Mm -hmm. by just, you know, opening the, open the dialogue and let them know they've got a safe place that they can message or they can call, you know, I'm willing to go say yes Mm -hmm. and go sit down and, you know, just have coffee or listen, um, because, I had people that always said, you know, hey, call me if you need anything. Call me if you need anything. But I'm like, is that, yeah, do I want to share this with you? Right. And so trying to look at it from that perspective and go, you know, hey, I can reach out. And if somebody doesn't want me to bother them, great. But I want to let people know that I'm here. If they genuinely want to have a conversation, I'll sit and listen and, you know, do anything we can to help from what we went through. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll share a best practice. Uh, I'm still not great at in instituting it yet, but I had a wonderful guest on just a few weeks ago, Mr. Bobby Hopkins, yeah. and he picks three people per week that he has not spoken to in, in a significant amount of time, mm-hmm. whether that is all the way back to high school or college, or whether it's just somebody that he used to talk to all the time and hasn't spoken to in you know a few months. And he strategically reaches out and just says, catch me up on what you're doing. And I thought that was just an amazing best practice, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. oh, because, that's great. because you're right. We, we tell people all the time, it's like, Hey, let me know if you need anything. But in our mind, it's like, Oh, that's just what people say. But yeah, if they meant it, and I think a lot of people actually do, and we don't utilize it. Well, I mean, we're kind of, uh, being ungrateful to their, uh, their offer. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. I've been on the other side of it a few times where I've had somebody that was, you know, thoughtful enough to reach out for no mm-hmm. reason at all. And it always kind of catches me off guard. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. And I, you know, even have conversations with Stacy and I'm like, you know, you know, so-and-so I'm like, man, they really, they're, they're really nice. They really, they really care. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's no hidden agenda there yeah. and they really, they really just called to say, Hey, and I don't think I do enough of that. Mm-hmm. And I think around what me and my family have been through, we haven't done enough of that. So, I mean, I think that's, that's phenomenal yeah, is yeah. just to be there. Cause that's, that's the ultimate goal is to, you know, be there when people need you to be there for somebody else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What's the most fun experience you've ever had in your entire life? My entire life. Man. <laughs> when I say that, it makes it sound like my entire life, man, that's a long time. So, I mean, the, the earliest memory I have, so this is kind of like my childhood. So the, the funnest thing that I remember, I was, um, eight years old mm-hmm. and, uh, I was at a Nashville sounds game back in the day. And, uh, I got picked to do the, they used to bring this big board out the home plate, had a hole in the middle. And you had to throw three pitches and, you know, however many you got through the, through the hole, you got different prizes. Mm-hmm. And so I was eight years old and, uh, through the first one went through, you know, most people got like one, maybe none. Everybody's kind of laughing about it. It's two, three, throw all three of them through. And like one of the only people to ever do it at that time, which was, I mean, it's forever ago, gosh, 1979 or something like that, you know, all three of them. And I win like a hundred dollar gift card to a boot place or something and um like dozen donuts for a year it's like this just something crazy you know now i look back and i'm like you know it's, it's wild but it was it just it stuck in my head as probably one of the funnest things i ever did and probably one of the times that i felt like i was just on top of the world yeah. because i remember when the third one went through eight years old i ran across the field jumped into my dad's arms and he's like you know hold me up in the crowds you know, cheering for me like I just won the World Series when I just yeah. won a little contest on the field. And it's just, it sticks in my head of just like, man, it was such a, such a feeling of just like, man, I'm on top of the world. And I was like eight years old. So, I mean, it was definitely by far probably the funnest thing ever. Well, and I, as you're telling me that story, I'm thinking of your dad's point of view. And oh my gosh, how, how proud he had to have been. Like, yeah. you know, you get randomly drawn out of the crowd, you go up there and just sink all three when yeah. you got, probably everybody else has struggled and that's you know that's why there's this you know year of donuts yeah. nobody's ever going to do it <laughs> nobody's ever yeah it was so cool and as a parent now i remember watching my boys play ball and different stuff so yeah i can just imagine what it was like for him and that's it kind of helps me realize like why he was like holding me up real high and the crowd going crazy because not only was i thinking this is the funnest thing in the world he was probably thinking how proud he was at that moment you know, like that's my boy yeah look what he just did yeah yeah absolutely what so, an awesome moment it was so fun <laughs> that's great man you know my son the very first game we ever took him to we yeah. took him to a sounds game i think he was six years old and kind of the same thing we we get there we're walking in and they go do you want to announce tonight Oh wow! And so they pull a six year up, to, uh, six year old up to the booth, and he nailed it. Wow! And of course, I'm I'm over there like your dad, just as proud as I could possibly yeah, be. Yeah, so that's so cool. You're like I've got little Harry Carey here. Yeah, <laughs> he's ready was, to go. Yep. Oh, it was tons <laughs> of fun. Um, but it, I love those moments that you get to spend with your parents. That just there's you couldn't have orchestrated them, you couldn't have planned them, but they were perfect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, oh, never. It, it, it stands out so far. Like when you just said, what's a fun time of your life? It's like, don't even have to think. It's just yeah. like, it's right there. Mm-hmm. Like, man, just, yeah. I remember I was on a podcast once and they were like, we don't believe in perfect. And I said, you, you may not be able to be perfect all day or all year, but you can have moments of perfection that you wouldn't trade for anything. Totally and I think agree. that's it. Exactly. Yeah. So what totally a great agree. moment. Thank yeah. you for sharing that, Jamie. Of that's, course. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that we always try to do here is we try to have an action item, something that somebody could take, you know, that you have kind of fine tuned through your 30 years of doing mortgages, uh, a best practice or something that almost anybody could take that nugget and plug it into their life and make their life better. What, what do you think something that you would classify as that would be? Yeah, I think it goes back to a little bit what we were talking about with kids, because I think it applies to anyone. Mm-hmm. I think just you know, reaching out, I think it's particular into mortgages. I tell people all the time, just have the conversation, you know, and it, it, kind of all the aspects of my life lead back to just having the conversation, 
you know, if I need to talk to somebody about how I'm struggling, what I'm going through in life, it's really hard to solve it by yourself. I mean, you can spend time, you can, you can reflect, you can have, you know, inner thoughts and you can, you know, talk to yourself and that kind of stuff. But I think reaching out to somebody and just having a conversation, whether it's you're going through a rough time or there's something you want to do in life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm really big and I've told my kids a thousand times too. There's something you want to do in life. Find somebody that's done it. Mm -hmm. Talk to them or, you know, call somebody that's expert in that field. When it comes to mortgages, if you want to buy a home, you don't have to go buy it tomorrow, but talk to somebody and see how to get on track to get there. Um, I think, I just think communication is so huge. And through the years I've learned more and more, the only way to find out about anything is to ask somebody about it. I mean, you've just, you've got to ask somebody. Yeah. And if you can, you know, like I said, if you know somebody that's where you want to go, that's the best place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they've been through it. Yeah. yeah. And they're going to have the best advice to tell you how to get started and help you learn it. So, you know, from the smallest thing to the largest thing, I think the best thing you can do is just reach out and be, be open-minded about it. If that's really where you want to go or what you need help with, you can find it. You've just got to be willing to be open-minded and be open to it. Yeah. Well, they can't help you if you don't ask for yeah, the help. Absolutely. You know, they're not mind readers. Yeah. Um, I've got so many things cause I'm, you know, in my fifties now, so many things that I go, I wish I would have asked somebody sooner. So that's why I think that's the first step is, you know, it, it, I learned a whole lot of that process through our grief and through losing Ryan um, was how much you need other people. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, through through high school, um, college age, all that kind of stuff, I was very quiet, didn't talk to a lot of people, and, and really just didn't share hardly any thoughts. I was really bad about keeping everything inside. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned through Stacy, through what we went through with Ryan, about how much just being open and talking to people. I mean, it, you know, I kind of fell into sales almost 30 years ago into mortgages and people that I went to high school are like, dude, I can't believe when I see a video of you talking, like you barely, you know, said a word in high school. Like you just did your thing, didn't barely talk to anybody. Um, and it's such a, such a more healthy, enjoyable experience in life, sharing it with other people. Mm -hmm. So, um, just, you know, opening your mind and being able to reach out and talk to people is, has been huge for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, this this next part is where we have a little bit of fun. All right. Um, so, obviously, you know I'm a bowler. Oh yeah. And we, your son and I, share something in common. We do. We both got that uh, elusive 300. Although he did it a lot earlier than I did. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've got you've got a task. You've got a task to put together a celebrity or people you know it could be anybody on this planet, but you're putting together the bowling team and it's, it's going to be televised and it's going to mm. raise money for charity and uh, we're going to raise awareness for the blood drive. Who is on that team? Mm. Do they have to be good bowlers? They just have to be we're people just, that you want to share that moment with. Yeah. So we've been talking a little bit about family. Yeah. And so, I mean, if we're going to market anything as much, as much as I can't believe I'm saying this for my wife's sake, we're probably going to have to have Taylor Swift there. Okay. <laughs> just because the, just because the, you know, the Swifty nation is, is so huge. That's right. And everybody's going to come no matter what's going on. So I'll, I'll give her some props and I'll add her in there. Okay. Um, I think every time I think about this question, I probably greedily, you know, my favorite athlete of all time is Michael Jordan. So I'd probably have him there just cause I might get to say a word or two to him in between frames or something. So yeah. Definitely have him there. Uh, we've got a four-man team. Four, well, you right. and you and four others. Okay, okay. So we've got three there. Um, we're probably going to include, oh, man, this, yeah, this is tough. Probably have to include my, my son, Baylor, because he's, you know, he's got the 300 game there, so we need a, a ringer of, of some sort. That's right. So we'll put him in there. Um, and then, you know, probably, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to stay on the athlete side somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, with marketing and everything that's going on, probably bring Tom Brady out of retirement to, uh, to, uh, I don't think there's anything he can do wrong. So he probably can bowl as well or yeah. you know, figure it out somehow. Probably so. So I think if we had that team, we're probably, I mean, I don't know how well we're going to bowl, but we're going to pack the place. That's right. For sure. I mean, right. we're going <laughs> to, so you got Taylor Swift you got Michael Jordan, you got your, your son Baylor, and then you got Tom Brady, you, and you get to pick the commentator. The commentator is there to bring it all together and make this the party of the century, who's going to commentate? Man, I mean, I'm, I'm probably, 
I might be a little old school on this one too, but I was just talking about the other day how great Bob Euchre is. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> in my head, that would be phenomenal to have to have Euchre there calling it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I will say that you're not the only one that has said that they would they would ask Bob Euchre to come really? out of retirement uh, <laughs> to commentate. So uh, you guys will have to watch to see see who else <laughs> said the same. Uh, that's fun. I love it. What's the best book you've ever read? Oh man. You got some good ones. <laughs> <laughs> you you have really really got some good ones. Um you know, probably the 7 habits of highly effective people. It's That's probably, a great one. Yeah. That's, you can't go wrong there. You can't. There's some older ones, there's some Zig Ziglar books and different stuff that I've read, but that one probably had the the most impact. I mean, you know, a lot of those those classics, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, there's some there's some real great ones that have influenced me, especially with the career path that I've chosen. Yeah. But yeah, probably that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah you can't go wrong with that one. Yeah. Um, all right, somebody out there right now is struggling, whether it's in their business, whether it's in their personal life, uh, whether it's to do with money or marriage or who knows what. Um, what, what do you, what's just a blanket piece of advice that you think somebody could put to use in order to get that foot in front of the other and, and push forward? I mean, you know, first and foremost, like I said before, I would definitely speak to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's nothing in life that you have to go through alone. Um, I feel like we were, we were put here on this earth to be around other people. Um, I'm a Christian, so I lean on my, my faith a lot, and I think there's a reason that there's, there's people around here for us, is for us to reach out to and talk to. So um, I know we talked about that being kind of a piece of advice, but when I was struggling, <clears throat> when I was at my lowest, it was the fact that when I finally talked to somebody about it, it gave me some hope. Yeah. Um, and it just, you know, and maybe they weren't the person that solved anything for me, mm -hmm. um, but they listened, and that, that gave me strength to have the next conversation the next conversation and kind of some of those people that said call me if you need something call me if you need something i realized some of those people not only meant it but they would connect me with the people that i needed to be around mm -hmm. so you know i think i think keeping everything inside being alone doesn't lead to to anything anything good yeah um, i've learned personally <clears throat> over many many years of trying to fix everything myself um, and, you know, talk through everything myself is, is has not led me to the best, you know, mm -hmm. results. So I would definitely just say, you know, at least just have a conversation. It doesn't have to be about what they're going through. That's the other thing mm -hmm. I thought, you know, is when I was struggling um, different times through my life, I thought I always had to find somebody to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. That might be the ultimate goal, but just having somebody to listen, somebody saying like, call me if you need anything. Sometimes you just need somebody to listen. Sometimes you just need somebody like Gabby's friend to sit there and say, I'm going to be here till you don't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. She didn't demand any conversation. She didn't demand you get up and you get better right now. She just said, I'm going to be here. And so I've, I've learned that too. Sometimes just having somebody around can give you that little glimpse of hope that you need to be able to move on to the next, to the next step. Yeah. Well, I will say this, you know, one of the things that we pray for every night uh, is just part of our our everyday prayer is that God give hope to those who have lost hope. And sometimes mm -hmm. it takes somebody offering to listen. And then at the same time, that person has to be willing to receive that, that person has to be willing to engage. And so God can send his messengers and, and try, but we have to be open to it. Amen. You do for sure. We gotta Absolutely. Our, we got to do our part. Yeah, we do. Um, right now in your career, What's your biggest problem in your business? Oh, man. Biggest problem. My biggest problem is there's not enough time in the day, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've got my mind is one of those that just races all the time. Mm -hmm. um, my wife tells me all the time, like, don't you ever just kind of slow down? You know, and I'm like, not really. Uh, <laughs> we, we wake up on Saturday and she's kind of like, so where are we going today? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm just I'm kind of always. And so it's a good it's a good and bad thing. I feel like I'm never trying to stop getting better, stop implementing new things. I'm not, I'm not easily satisfied with like, okay, business is good. Let's roll this way for a little while. So, um, you know, the hardest part is determining what I want to do the most and what can help the most amount of people. Yeah. So just really prioritizing and, uh, and really taking time for the things that I need to take time for. So just kind of, 
you know, making sure I'm where I need to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we, I think that is an ongoing thing, especially for entrepreneurs. Sure. Is, is we're, we're constantly having to ask, check in with ourselves. Is this the best use of my time? Sure. Because it may be that I need to be at home on the couch with my family, or it may be that I need to be out here hustling. Yeah. And you know, d- different, different times for different things. Yeah. So and that's, I feel like that's one of the hardest parts of being that kind of person is because yeah. you want to do, you want to do all of it yeah. and you want to say, Hey, I'm, I'm prioritizing my family and I'm staying here. Then sometimes you're saying I'm doing this because I want to be there for my family, mm-hmm. but we're also not guaranteed time here. No. So you've got to find a way to say, you know, you can't always say I'm doing this for them if you can never be with them. Well, and, and yeah. back to our conversation about defaulting to yes, if we say yes to something, a lot of times that means we're saying no to something else. Absolutely. But, and my, my best advice to, any, to anybody is be conscious of that. Say yeah. yes to the right things and say no to the things that you, you can yeah. reasonably say no to. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, how do you want to be remembered? Man. Loaded question again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, I tell people all the time, my favorite thing to be called on this earth is dad. You know, I, I'm, I'm loving being a grandfather now and it's amazing. So, I mean, I don't think there could be any better legacy than to, you know, be remembered as the dad and, and granddad that my kids loved, learned from and enjoyed being around. So, I mean, that would, that would mean everything to me. The rest mm-hmm. of it's not, not as important. I think it'll be great if I make an impact on as many lives as I possibly can. But if I can leave something good for my kids and grandkids, I'll be happy. I love it. Yeah. Jamie, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Really I, enjoyed it. Absolutely, man. All right. So that's the Charge Forward podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, thank you to our special guest, Mr. Jamie Steelman, dad, granddad, coach. Get out there. Please donate blood. Please uh, take, make that a priority. Put that into your life. Put it, schedule it. You can download the app. It is super easy. Again, this is the Charge Forward Podcast. Special thanks to the creative team here at the Hit Lab in Nashville, Tennessee. And thank you to our sponsors, Charge Forward Solutions and Sense Custom Development. Until next time, we'll see you later. Team, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the Charge Forward Podcast. Look forward to other amazing guests. And until next time, I'm your host, Jim Cripps. Special thanks, as always, to Nick Heider and the creative team at Hit Lab Studios here in Nashville, Tennessee. Special thanks to our sponsors, Sense Custom Development and Charge Forward Solutions. Please be sure to like and subscribe.